have Paris event. Um, I am uh, Marie Isabelle Delar. I'm the ICCF representative for France, together with Armand Terrien, who should be joining us soon. Uh, I want to thank very much Meyer Brown, Alina Loveano, and William Aaron for hosting this event. So as I said, this is a Paris ICCF event, but because we were doing webinars and uh, working remotely now, we have uh, the luck of having such an incredible lineup of speakers and a uh, very prestigious keynote speaker, which maybe would not have been possible if this event was to uh, be held in person. So I guess this is one of the positive aspects of the current time. The ICCF network uh, is a network of young practitioners um, sub 40 created by the ICC, and we strongly encourage you to register on our, on our website to receive our newsletter because there are so many events that are being organized, especially now that we're able to do them remotely and you certainly find interesting events in your region. So I will now introduce uh, William and Alina who are hosting this event, and then I will uh, pass the floor to them. So Will is a senior associate in the Paris office of Mayor Brown. He's uh, admitted to the Paris Bar and to the Supreme Court of Queensland in Australia. He works in investment and commercial arbitration. He's particularly uh, experienced in investor state arbitration, which will uh, more particularly be the topic today. Uh, he's, uh, he's acted both as, um, as counsel for both investors and states. Uh, in many investor state arbitrations in various regions, Europe, Africa, uh, the Middle East, and in a wide variety of sectors. Alina is a senior legal consultant, also in the international arbitration practice of uh, the Paris office of Meyer Brown. She represents companies in commercial arbitrations and mediations in complex disputes um, in different sectors and industries. And prior to joining Meyer Brown, Alina was the manager of the uh, ICC International Center for ADR, and she was responsible for the ICC's ADR services, and uh, which is of particular importance here too, she served as global co-chair of the uh, ICCF from 2016 to uh, July 2019. So we're particularly pleased to now organizing an event uh, with Alina in her new capacity. I will now pass the floor to Dan to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Isabel, um, for your kind introduction. Uh, but really, uh, for, for the hard work that both you and Armand are doing in, in promoting the ICCF throughout the world, well, in particular, of course, in, in Europe and Russia, as you are ICCF representatives for uh, this region. Um, as, as you know, ICCF has always been a project very close to my heart. And, um, and I, I'm I'm particularly thrilled to see it growing and, and to see the amazing job you and Armand are doing in, in creating opportunities such as the one today, such as today's event, um, to better inform, connect, and inspire young professionals uh, with interests in arbitration or, or generally in, in dispute resolution. So thank you. Uh, and for those of you listening to us this morning, as, as Marie Isabel said, make sure you register to become an ICCF member and do get in touch with Marie Isabel and Armand or any, you know, the respective ICCF representative in your region should you wish to organize an event uh, such as the one uh, we're doing today. Now, um, back to our event. William and I are absolutely delighted to host today's event. Um, on the topic of equality of parties before international investment tribunals. Um, the topic we've chosen um, is quite broad and uh, was a subject of a study and the two, uh, 2019 resolution of the Institut du droit international. We do have the immense pleasure of, of having Toby, Toby Landau QC with us this morning. Toby will first give his views on the topic and thereafter, we'll be joined by Laura, Harshad, and Gabriele for a panel discussion on issues which are covered by the study and the resolution, but which we essentially focused on three subtopics. The effect of the state's criminal law powers on the tribunal's process, the state's right to institute counterclaims, and the equality of parties um, in the composition of international investment tribunals. Now, let me introduce you our keynote speaker. Toby, Toby Landau QC. Well, most of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with his profile and his background. Toby doesn't really need an introduction, but here we go. So Toby Landau QC is an excellent advocate and arbitrator 
who draws a claim as the most brilliant international arbitration barrister in the market. And those are not my words, but his client's words. And they have been included in the Who's Who's Legal Global 2021. Toby is indeed a barrister, advocate and arbitrator, and the member of the bars of England and Wales, Singapore, New York, the BVI and Northern Ireland, and registered in the DIFC. He practices in London from Essex Court Chambers and in Singapore from Essex Court Chambers Duxton, Singapore Group Practice. As counsel, Toby has a broad commercial and international practice in London and Singapore and has argued hundreds of major international commercial, investor state and interstate arbitration, as well as many groundbreaking cases in the highest courts of England, Singapore, Hong Kong, Pakistan and the Caribbean, including by way of example, Dala, Givraj, and you know, most recently Halliburton versus Chubb before the UK Supreme Court. He's the first QC to have permanently um, been called to the Singapore bar. And since April 2012, he has been a member of the panel of advisors to the Attorney General of Singapore. As arbitrator, because we are lucky enough to have somebody who wears both hats, uh, as arbitrator, Toby has extensive experience sitting as chairman, co-arbitrator and sole arbitrator in commercial and investor state disputes under most of the world's leading ad hoc and institutional rules. He is a member of various panels, including ICSAID. Um, Toby, with no further ado, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, extraordinary introduction. Um, I, I do have a question for you, which is whether you're available for general PR services, uh, but that's something we can perhaps discuss, discuss separately offline. Um, welcome, <laughs> to, welcome to everyone. It's a great, great pleasure to be part of this very interesting program. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that everybody uh, has been able to join. Uh, my task is to set the scene for the panel discussion. Uh, and it's quite a broad scene, quite a broad landscape. Uh, it covers many, many different topics, um, many of which are very controversial. So I'm going to tiptoe my way through the landscape, picking up on what I think is relevant or particularly pertinent uh, as a matter of practice uh, in terms of equality um, as an ideal in investor state arbitration. The starting point is to grapple with the concept of equality, uh, its nature and its function. Uh, it is, of course, a fundamental um, aspect of dispute resolution, fundamental to a fair hearing. If you, if you take the Bible of international law, which is arguably uh, Bin Cheng, um, Bin Cheng uh, talks about the two cardinal aspects of uh, judicial process being the impartiality of a tribunal, but also its corollary, which is juridical equality between the parties in their capacity as litigants. So it is an absolutely fundamental principle, so fundamental we don't spend very much time actually talking about it. Uh, it is also, of course, fundamental to the rule of law. Uh, equality before the law uh, is something which would be universally accepted. It finds expression in human rights treaties, uh, Article 10 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and many others. When one's thinking about equality, there are three aspects which need to be separated, and they have been separated in the uh, IDI's uh, Commission report. Uh, and I think it's quite useful as a matter of analysis to keep them in one's mind. So firstly, there's a constitutional aspect of equality. Uh, and that is that it is a principle which is superior to other procedural rules. So it's, it's because of its importance, it's given a fundamental character. Uh, it sits at the centerpiece of our process and other procedural rules actually have to accommodate it. So the constitutional element is, is the first element. The second element or characteristic is reciprocity. Equality has in it the idea that one party will be accorded the same treatment as all the other parties whatever that treatment is. And then thirdly, there is a procedural principle. And the procedural principle is substantial equality has got to be maintained between the parties, which may actually involve treating them differently because they're in different, a different situation in order to arrive at a result which is substantially equal. And it's that last one, uh, the procedural principle, to achieve a balancing between the parties which is particularly relevant and particularly difficult in the context of investor state arbitration. So that takes me to 
from the general equality to the specific, which is international arbitration. And the starting point, because of the history of our field, is commercial arbitration, which then has, has spawned our modern, uh, slightly curious process of investor state arbitration. If we just look first of all at commercial arbitration, the idea of equality would be accepted by everyone as fundamental, as universal and as uncontroversial. And therefore you see statements of equality throughout our tools of trade. Uh, Article 18 of the Unsuitable Model Law uh, is the key classic statement. Article 7, what's now Article 17.1 of the 2010 uh, Unsuitable Rules, uh, which used to be Article 15 of the 1976 Rules, which in Methanex and the USA was called the heart of the Unsuitable Rules. Classic statements of, uh, of equality. It crops up in case law all around the world. Uh, it is uh, articulated with a passion in France, um, for, for historical reasons, which we see in many cases, including the very recent one of PT Ventures, which is a recent expression of Dutco uh, in, the, um, in the International Chamber of uh, the Paris Court of Appeal, talking about the equality of parties as being so fundamental, it would justify changing other rules to do with the appointment of arbitrators, and in that case, allowing for the constitution of a bench of five arbitrators. And of course, it's in the New York Convention. Uh, Article 5, 1b, as a ground for resisting recognition and enforcement. So when you shift then from all of that, which is commercial arbitration, into the world of investor state arbitration, the natural assumption is it's all the same. It's arbitration, equality is equality, it just transposes into this field without any difficulty. And that, uh, unhappily, is not so. Uh, why do we have that assumption? And we have that assumption, I think, for two reasons. One is that for some odd quirk of history, which I'm going to come back to, we have uh, burdened ourselves in investor state arbitration with a commercial arbitration procedural model. So even though investor state arbitration is completely different in nature, we have simply drawn across the commercial arbitration process with all of its baggage without any proper accommodation for what is a different system. And secondly, I think we have this assumption because most, not all, but most people who populate the world of investor state arbitration grew up in commercial arbitration. So that is their vocabulary. That's what they know. You, you will, of course, know that the world of investor state arbitration can be divided into two. There is a very small elite group of refined, pure public international lawyers and then there's the rest of everyone who are grubby commercial lawyers who started in commercial arbitration and have now reinvented themselves as public international lawyers because of the advent of investor state. And these are people who see the world through the prism of commercial arbitration and struggle and fight and resist when you say to them that actually this is a very different field. There are tensions, obviously, in the investor state field. Uh, and these tensions, a lot of them, are actually coming out of the difficulty of applying principles of equality to what is a system involving two unequal parties in most cases, that is investor and state. In truth, the process is very different and the pressures in its short life have now come to the surface. As we all know, uh, as investor state arbitration has grown up, so has its sister discipline, backlash studies, and uh, there is a, now a movement uh, against the field. There is the Ulster Trial Working Group 3 uh, looking at other alternatives. There's talk of a multilateral investment standing court. And the question is whether or not we can do better uh, with what we've got than what we've got with some new system. So let me now drill down onto what I think are the key problems of equality, which are giving rise to some of these tensions. There are three aspects I'm going to focus on. The first one is actually a little bit of scene setting, uh, but it's worth bearing it in mind. And that is to recall the nature of investor state arbitration and why it is essentially different from commercial arbitration. Secondly, the structure of investor state arbitration, which gives rise to inherent structural inequalities. And lastly, the practice, the practical reality of investor state arbitration, where one can see all sorts of areas of inequality, 
but the inequality, interestingly, militates in different directions. Uh, there are some uh, issues which are to the advantage of the investor, and there are some which are to the advantage of the state. And the ultimate burden is on the tribunal to balance and uh, or counterbalance for these issues, um, weaknesses within the system. So let me start with the first of those, which is the nature of investor state arbitration. The simplest way, in my view, of conceptualizing this is to see investor state arbitration as a vertical system of dispute resolution. In commercial arbitration, one's dealing with a horizontal system. That is parties who are operating on a similar plane at a similar level. They can be counterparties to a contract. Usually they are uh, to some kind of transaction. They are operating as, e as equivalent entities, even if one of them is a state. They are contracting parties uh, or they are parties to one particular economic activity. Uh, they have a dispute and that dispute uh, is encapsulated by or it's, it's uh, defined and delimited by their commercial relationship. Simple. But in investor state arbitration, you've got a vertical relationship, which is much, much more like public law. You've got an individual investor who is making a claim not to an entity at the same level, but against an entity above it, which is a sovereign entity. And it's questioning the exercise of sovereign discretion, whether it's judicial, whether it's legislative or executive. It's, it's saying that a state government, an entity has not exercise that discretion properly. And that would not just necessarily impact on the investor, it may impact on the entire population. It may impact on the entire way that the government or the state is operating. And that's why it's not horizontal, it's vertical. They're not equivalent. They are, the investor and the state are operating at different levels with different considerations according to different criteria. Uh, and the impact will be uneven of the, of the actual arbitration. So that, if one were to start afresh in an ideal magical world without commercial arbitration, that wouldn't point one immediately to a commercial arbitration model, which is built upon equal counterparties. It might actually, in, a, in an imaginal world, it might actually point one to some kind of administrative process, some kind of inquiry process, a process that's not bilateral, that's not confrontational in a limited litigation sense. Uh, it might be much broader, allowing for all interested parties or parties who may potentially be affected to come and, and present their case. But we don't have that. We have instead uh, the imposition of an Anglo-US model of commercial arbitration, not even a civil law model. It is the Anglo-US model, uh, which involves disputing parties, fighting it out, in front of a detached tribunal that sits above them and acts as an umpire without investigating and without taking the initiative uh, to explore facts or law. Uh, and so there are inequalities in that system, in that process, which are not reflected in the actual arbitration mechanism itself. So that then takes me to the next two last two points, which is where are the inequalities then? The inequalities are firstly structural and then they are procedural. So let's start with structural. The way that investor state treaties are structured or bilateral investment treaties, free trade agreements and equivalent investment chapters, they are structured so that they are one sided. They are, uh, they are, and this is a state choice. They do not generally allow for counterclaims. So that will be one issue that the panel uh, after my initial rant is over the panel will analyze in proper detail. Uh, but, and of course, one can't say, well, this is a problem because it's states have chosen it. Uh, so they've chosen an, an unequal system. But practically speaking, that bears upon equality. Because in each case, if you do not allow counterclaims, of course, there are some exceptions. And there are, there are, there's an analysis which has been put forward in some cases to allow for them. But in the vast majority of cases, counterclaims are not allowed. If you exclude counterclaims, you're excluding part of the story. That actually has an impact on the way in which a state can present its case because it, it, it has the forensic disadvantage that it can't put attention away from itself and plant it squarely on the investor. 
Uh, that could be in a formal set off, which might actually reduce its damages or might actually change the outcome of the case. But more subtly, it also has a forensic impact on equality because it prevents a state from actually presenting its case with the investor at the at the center of it uh, with a claim. And that uh, that may well be accommodated in other ways in investor state arbitration, but it's uncertain how that's done. So, for example, questions such as investor responsibility. To what extent does investor responsibility sound as an answer to a treaty claim? Uh, and that is an area of uncertain substantive law. Um, it would be easier uh, to articulate it if, if there were counterclaims, but we don't have that. And so that is an, an essential structural inequality at the moment. The second structural one is the problem of parallel claims. The way that investor state treaties are structured and the way that the law has developed is such that, of course, one dispute can give rise to multiple claims under multiple treaties. That is an inequality in the system because one state may often have a, a number of different arbitrations that it has to fight over the same event. Um, we do not have a system of consolidation or we don't have a system which is a clear system yet uh, or a universal system for coordinating parallel claims. We have a nascent law from cases such as Oriscom and Vodafone about abuse of rights, the possibility of stopping parallel claims. But the inequality, of course, comes with the famous saying that an investor has only got to win once. A state has got to win every time. And so actually the dynamic is such that states are faced often with what they say is an unfair system of having to fight multiple times. And that is one of the complaints that actually is featuring in the current uh, skepticism, criticism, reform discussions about the area. So those are some of the basic structural issues. Now moving lastly, but there's more detail I'm afraid, to the practical issues of inequality. And there are many of them. So firstly, points where the investor has the advantage in terms of basic equality. Uh, within this, uh, one used to say, and I think one can't say this quite so much anymore, one used to say that there was actually an inequality of knowledge and experience because this is a young area of, of uh, dispute resolution. But in the early stages, very few people knew anything about it, and least of all were states actually in terms of being equipped. So there used to be much more of an inequality in terms of access to information. A state would receive a claim and wouldn't know anything about it, wouldn't know anything about the treaty, wouldn't know what investor state arbitration is and would be starting from scratch, whereas an investor often would have a smart law firm with proper um, advice and proper be well equipped. Now, I think that's something which one can't say as much anymore because we are a number of years down the line and there is widespread experience. And now some of the most experienced practitioners are actually acting in attorney general's departments or ministers of law because of states who have a lot of experience. So that I wouldn't raise as being necessarily so significant. It will, it will be relevant in some cases. But here's another one that is uh, relevant in every case. And that is, the timing and the strategy of commencing a case is, of course, 100% in the investor's hands. That's true of every case. Every case favors a claimant because the claimant can choose when to press the button. In investor state arbitration, that often sets up an initial inequality because the investor may have had months, sometimes years to prepare to get their documents together, to work out their theory of the case, to get their representation, um, uh, to, 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 to basically to be ready to go. When they press the button, a treaty may have a cooling off period. They may give three months, maybe six months. Sometimes there's no cooling off period. For a state, and with some honorable exceptions, many states are by definition dysfunctional, disorganized, large uh, and um, incoherent in their internal uh, uh, arrangements. Three months is not enough or six months is not enough. And they'll, they are starting on the back foot uh, and, it's a, and it's an exercise of catch up. Um, and that sometimes uh, can permeate the rest of the process unless a tribunal is sensitive to it. The next issue is related to that. Um, and that is the practical reality 
is that there's an inequality because many states are burdened by inter internal disorganization. They are burdened by budget issues in a way that a, an investor may not be, which will, which will limit the way that they can be represented and what they can actually do. They'll be limited by domestic politics. They will be limited by uh, changes of government and changes of personnel and by a lack of institutional memory. Most governments, I have acted for many, many governments. The day after I retire, I will be publishing, uh, naming them, uh, which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, and which are the utterly dreadful ones. And that's quite a large chapter. Uh, the lack of institutional memory is something which, uh, which there's no immediate cure for, but it means you have an election or you have a change of personnel and all the knowledge is gone. And that means some poor chap is or the lady is sitting in an office not knowing anything and trying to find out what happened in the case. Now add to that all the countries that are split between federal and provincial government. The federal government as a matter of international law will be responsible and yet all the knowledge, the documents, or the conduct will be in the hands of some provincial government somewhere else within the country. So to join up those dots can be a formidable task, which this, the investor will never have. Nothing equivalent, however disorganized the company may be, it's never on the same scale. Uh, and so those are issues which, which set up a, an advantage uh, for investors. Of course, that's true in any case, uh, which is against a state, not just investor state, but the problem with investor state arbitration is that the stakes, the sensitivity, the scale tends to be heightened. These tend to be much larger issues, which are more politically difficult to handle. The third point that's relevant here is that all of those internal problems, and especially that early incoherence when a state is getting itself together to understand the claim, have an early but often fatal impact or near fatal impact. And that is on the constitution of the tribunal. At the stage where a tribunal is constituted, states are often only ramping up in terms of their understanding, whereas a claimant investor will be fully prepared. If you add to that domestic politics about who will be an acceptable person to put on to, to, a, to appoint to a tribunal, there are constraints that states have that investors don't have. Now, this is not something you read in textbooks, but this is a practical reality. You can say as a matter of theory, states have got a choice. They can choose who they want as their co-arbitrator, end of story, it's equal to an investor. But actually in truth on the ground, very often I will have discussions with an attorney general or government official who will say, I would dearly like to have Miss so-and-so, but I cannot because the population wouldn't accept it. This is a big high stakes case. So for example, uh, it's got to be a Muslim or it's got to be somebody who doesn't look white and Western, or it's got to be somebody who will be acceptable to the local uh, audience, the local constituency. And that narrows down the choice massively. And if you look at the history of party appointments, uh, co-arbitrators by states, it's an unhappy history uh, where choices sometimes are curious. I think that is less of a problem now as the pool of arbitrators has got bigger. And so there is more diversity, there's more range. There's a huge, huge way to go, as we all know, to improve that, uh, both in terms of gender, but also in terms of geography uh, and in terms of cultural background. Uh, but that is a problem which I think is actually a, a, an inequality in, in the process. And lastly, uh, the investor has the advantage of the allergy that most government representatives have in taking responsibility for any decision. Uh, most government officials would rather not take a decision if they don't have to or delegate it uh, because of the impact, the ad possible adverse impact. Um, and so, again, that's one of the other inequalities. Now, if we then shift over, and I'm about to finish, um, I can see looks of concern around the around my gallery view, but I'm, I'm nearing the end. Uh, what, what about on the other side? On the other side, there is a much, much longer list, so I'll be much quicker. There are many inequalities which feed actually to the advantage of a state. Firstly, the state is the one with huge power locally to cause trouble, to restrict visas, to uh, arrange for injunctions, um, to put local pressure on the investor. So pressure points tend to be in the hands of the state. Of course, that's all dangerous ground if it, it has an adverse impact as far as the tribunal is concerned. 
Uh, one of my earliest experiences as an arbitrator uh, in investor state arbitration was in SGS Pakistan, where I was appointed by Pakistan. That was until I resigned uh, because I was a subject of an injunction uh, from the Pakistan Supreme Court uh, not to um, not not to carry on, uh, and because I had a presence in Pakistan and 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 didn't want to spend uh, any time in a Pakistan prison. So that's something which, of course, is a uh, an advantage of of a state. It, it backfires in many cases, but that's one of the first ones. Second one related local criminal proceedings. This is something which will be discussed in the panel. I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder, but the, I'll just list some of the issues. Criminal local criminal proceedings are very common. They set up tensions because of the very existence of parallel proceedings and all the inconvenience of that. They set up an impact with respect to the collection of evidence, which then is not in the hands of one tribunal, but in two centers where evidence may be collected differently. They thirdly can be a pressure point, obviously, for investor parties. And fourthly, and I'm afraid in a number of my cases I have seen this close up, uh, they can be the source of intimidation of witnesses and intimidation of party representatives in order to dissuade them from actually taking part in the process. And, and there are many examples uh, which I can give, including an ongoing case where uh, many potential witnesses, um, uh, journalists, are reluctant to testify because they have been given death sentences by the state in question in absentia. Uh, so that puts an issue onto a tribunal as to how to respond to that uh, obvious area of inequality. Related to that, thirdly, local civil proceedings. These come in many shapes and sizes. They can be local insolvency proceedings. They can be proceedings on the same substance of the dispute. And interestingly, they can be proceedings which will arrive at a determination of local law that might actually then be deployed as a conclusive statement of local law to the treaty tribunal, where the treaty tribunal has got to refer to local law. Uh, and that, that can be a bias in the system uh, and an inequality. Fourth point, the state often is the only entity with control of the travaux preparatoire of the treaty. Travel preparatoire are deployed frequently in investor state cases, but very infrequently is there a complete record the complete record is in the hands of the state, not the investor. Uh, getting hold of it can be very difficult, uh, and a state often can uh, pick and choose as to what it feels it's able or wants to um, disclose. The next point, excuse me, the next point is the ability for states to join up with the other contracting state to the treaty and agree on the meaning of the treaty. This is a potential source of inequality. As an investor, if you are faced with an agreement, even a subsequent agreement between the host country and the non-arbitrating state party as to what a treaty provision means, that becomes an issue uh, as to whether the tribunal will actually be um, persuaded by that or whether that will be conclusive. And then lastly, <coughs> you have the issue of state secrets and privilege which is less of a problem ever since Pope and Talbot and the IBA rules, but is still an issue which crops up very frequently um, and is a, a, just a state issue, not an investor issue. So drawing all of this together, I leave you with the following thought, and that is whether or not the model that we are using, which is the Anglo-US commercial arbitration model, is really designed for these kinds of tensions. Um, how much can tribunals within the scope and the limitations of that procedural model counterbalance for these inequalities? My own experience is that it's an uneven record. There are tribunals that do well and there are those that struggle. And again, if you ask the question, if you start started from a fresh piece of paper from a blank page, you wouldn't really end up uh, with this process uh, naturally. The question is, is there then an alternative uh, which is better? And all of this is now pressing, uh, and it's important that we come up with a, a, a proper answer for the very future of this area of practice. I'm well into injury time, but that's all I want to say. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Toby, for those insightful, uh, thought-provoking uh, comments. Um, you can rest assured there was no concern on our end about you going over time. We could have kept listening, uh, you know, for, for much longer. Um, 
Uh, so uh, thank you for so comprehensively addressing the many issues that arise in the subject of equality of parties uh, before investment tribunals, um, which, as you mentioned, uh, are broad and varied. And, and thank you for pointing to the fact that the issue uh, is, 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 is very specific when it comes to investment arbitration itself, uh, which I guess uh, is what led to the study by the Institut de Droit International, uh, which was very comprehensive, uh, led by the rapporteur Campbell McLaughlin, uh, which then led uh, to the resolution in 2019. Uh, so thank you also for for uh, setting the scene and introducing some of the topics uh, that we will be drilling down into you know, in a bit more detail with the rest of our speakers, uh, who I will introduce shortly. Um, so when we when we looked at the study uh, of 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 the institute and its resolution, as you as you rightly pointed out, there were. Uh, many, many issues, and we, we, we thought uh, we, we sought to choose those uh, with the more practical consequences or the consequences that we have seen arise in many of the cases that uh, ourselves as, as council have encountered. Uh, so before entering into those, and, and also uh, we're glad to, to note that Toby will be joining us on, on the round table with the other speakers, and we look forward to hearing more from him on these specific topics that we're, about, we're going to address. So let me now uh, introduce the fellow speakers who will be joining us on the round table and the particular topics that they will be introducing. So first we have uh, Laura Fadala, who is a senior associate in the international arbitration team of Bredam Pratt in Paris. She's admitted in both Paris and New York. Laura advises clients in relation to commercial arbitration and both investors and states in investment arbitration matters under a, a variety of rules. Uh, she also advises clients in arbitration related litigations, uh, including on enforcement and annulment. Laura will be providing introductory remarks on equality in investor state dispute settlement and uh, particularly with respect to the state's criminal justice power. Uh, we also have uh, Gabriele, who is a legal counsel at the Secretariat of the ICC International Court of Arbitration, where he supervises the administration of around 160 arbitration proceedings involving parties from several jurisdictions and disputes in the energy construction, IP, M&A, and other sectors. Prior to joining the ICC, Gabriele was an associate in Sherman and Sterling International Group in Paris, where he worked on both investor state and commercial arbitration proceedings. We then have Harshad, who is an Indian qualified lawyer and alumnus of the Geneva LLM in International Dispute uh, Settlement MIDS program. He's currently working as a senior associate in the international arbitration team at PNA Law Offices in New Delhi, India, where his primary practice area includes investment treaty arbitration, where he has significant uh, experience defending states. He also focuses on commercial arbitration and related litigation. Harshad is uh, also impaneled as a consultant for the Center for Trade and Investment Law established by the Ministry of Commerce and Industry of the Government of India. So I'll now pass the floor to Laura, uh, who will set out her introdu introductory remarks on the, uh, on the issue of equality of parties in a vested state dispute settlement and the state's criminal justice power. So over to you, uh, Laura. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, thank you, Will and Alina, for organizing uh, this very interesting event and for uh, allowing me to participate and to present uh, introductory remarks on the very rich topic of uh, criminal uh, justice powers of the state and equality of parties in uh, ISDS. Uh, thank you also uh, to uh, the YAF representative and the YAF team for giving us this forum to 
discuss uh, between uh, young practitioners. So turning to my topic of criminal proceedings, it is of course uh, very rich and so I will try to be as uh, brief as possible and as succinct as possible. We see that uh, the criminal justice power of states is being an increasing consideration in uh, ISDS uh, processes. Um, we see it at several stages uh, in the process. Of course, at the merit stage where you you can have an investor raising criminal proceedings uh, as a breach of the treaty, uh, such as indirect expropriation, FET or uh, FPS. Um, you can also have it often um, raised by the state, uh, especially at the stage of jurisdiction, um, when you come to the issue of whether or not the investment was made in accordance with domestic law. Here, uh, pending criminal proceedings can also be raised uh, to challenge this, uh, this uh, legality of the investment. Um, this does raise issues uh, that are uh, very interesting on the substance and the protection uh, afforded to litigants in the context of criminal proceedings in most states, um, such as presumption of innocence, uh, which I'm sure we'll, we'll be discussing uh, later on. Um, but these issues are mostly merits issues, um, not so much related to the process itself and the equality of the parties in the process, so I will not uh, focus too much on them. Uh, they are to be decided by tribunals on the basis of the evidence in front of it, uh, and that goes back also to uh, what uh, Toby mentioned uh, on the difficulty sometimes of states uh, gathering the evidence and in some cases, I've seen it uh, myself, whereby you had criminal proceedings that had started a long time ago with an investor waiting a long time to initiate the arbitration. And basically everybody with knowledge about these proceedings uh, being gone from the state uh, that we were representing. And uh, even us discovering uh, criminal proceedings that had been hidden by the investor uh, later on during document production uh, because the state was not able to identify them because of the complete loss of history. Um, but a separate question that I will be uh, more focusing on is the impact of the state's uh, criminal justice powers, uh, to use a broad term, uh, on the ISDS process itself and uh, through the lens of uh, this concept of equality of parties um, that might not be the most appropriate for uh, investment arbitration, as we've seen. Um, the first question and the first uh, aspect is really to define our, our problem when it comes to criminal proceedings and equality of parties. We have two clear borders. Um, on the one hand, uh, criminal justice is at the heart of a state sovereign power. Agreeing to arbitration obviously cannot be seen as agreeing to waive such a power that is extremely important, not for the state as a litigant, but to protect the interest of the society uh, of the state. So this is, of course, the first border, uh, the state's sovereignty. Um, the second border on the other end of the spectrum would be that a state uh, that has agreed to uh, international arbitration of its disputes against investors cannot use its powers and abuse its powers uh, in order to disrupt uh, the, the investment uh, arbitration process or the right of the investor to bring a claim. This will go at the other extreme because we are talking here about abuses, misuse of a sovereign power. But there is also the very rich and very large middle ground whereby you might not be in a clear case or, of misuse or abuse, but you do have parallel criminal proceedings that are initiated by the state be it before the arbitration or after the arbitration is started. Um, and these proceedings might have as an indirect effect, but a very, very pregnant effect, that they will interfere in way, one way or, or another with the claimant's ability to present its case. You will have issues of evidence of the state gathering evidence through the, in, um, the criminal proceedings that it might not have had access to otherwise. We've seen cases also, including with Will, where the state would seize the documents and computers and not only gain evidence, but deprive the investor of 
its own evidence because the investor didn't have access to those documents and uh, those computers anymore. Uh, you will have, of course, cases where even if you're not in a, in a misuse or abuse of process where pending criminal proceedings might act as um, might impress witnesses or might, might scare potential witnesses just because they are pending criminal proceedings in a country where they are involved or where they have a base, um, even without a clear uh, aspect of misuse. So having said that, uh, the question is how, and at least if they can and how they can, uh, how can investment tribunal try to rebalance in some way, even without going through the idea of pure equality of parties that, should, that does not apply clearly to investment arbitration in strict terms, especially when we're considering topics such as criminal justice. But how can an investment tribunal um, try to correct the uh, unwelcome effects of uh, this sovereign power? Uh, the the, the um, commission and the submission of the Commission on Equality of Parties um, in its resolution tackled the topic in its Article 11. This article focuses exclusively on the misuse and the abuse. Uh, it's titled Improper Means. Uh, it targets cases where the, viol the state has violated its good faith duty to participate to the arbitration. And it distinguishes two aspects that are core aspects uh, in these, uh, on this topic and that I've mentioned already. The first one being the evidence and the solution provided is that the tribunal may exclude evidence that is obtained in violation of the principle of good faith in the conduct of the proceedings and that it is essential to do so in order to preserve the equality of the parties. And second topic, the more direct interference with the state power and the state criminal justice power, which is an exceptional, obviously, power to recommend measures concerning the effect of the exercise of the state's criminal justice power upon the arbitration. Uh, this is very limited in uh, scope because, first, as mentioned, it is qualified as an exceptional power. It is to protect the fairness of the arbitration and the equality of the parties. And only if clear evidence of conduct that is aimed at obtaining, obtaining an unfair advantage in the proceedings is presented to the tribunal. So going back uh, quickly on those two aspects, uh, for the evidence, uh, we, we see tribunals that have to decide in the end on the admissibility of the evidence. And there have been cases where the tribunal has decided that evidence was inadmissible because it was obtained through criminal proceedings. There were also cases where the tribunal adjusted its requirements for admissibility of evidence and sometimes in order to sometimes help uh, the investor facing uh, the adversarial effects of criminal proceedings. Uh, for instance, uh, the option of providing only written uh, witness statements and not having people attend uh, the hearing in case of restrictions. So these are uh, places where the tribunal might show some flexibility or some strict decision power in order to take into account uh, the way the evidence was obtained or the limitations to the way the evidence is presented. Another uh, topic uh, that is extremely rich is the interim measure power of tribunals uh, in order to try to rebalance uh, the, the process and uh, the proceedings. Um, of course, uh, the first example is the uh, potential order to suspend the criminal proceedings or to suspend incarceration, to suspend extradition of uh, witnesses or party representatives. You can also have more specific uh, interim measures such as order to return documents, order to provide copies of uh, the documents seized or the, uh, the material uh, seized. Um, you can have tribunals shape uh, their interim measures in very specific ways, and that's something I'll, I'll come back on, um, because the interim measure uh, power of tribunals is very rich in the shape it can take. Um, the power itself of the tribunal to issue uh, interim measures 
is not discussed, di uh, disputed per se. You find the basis clearly in the ICSID convention. You can also find the basis in various arbitration rules if you're not under, uh, if you're not in an ICSID arbitration, such as uh, Article 26 of the ancestral rules. Uh, obviously, the ICC rules have a provision on interim measures and the power of tribunal. So this is not where the challenge uh, might be. The challenge will be more in assessing whether interim measures are called for uh, and what is the test to be applied for these interim measures, because tribunals have highlighted that ordering provisional measures that are aimed at counteracting with uh, criminal proceedings pending in the state is a very delicate situation. There is a very delicate ba balance to find, and the threshold has to be very high because this is a very clear sovereign power at the heart of the state sovereignty. So we've seen tribunals really highlighting uh, these uh, these concerns, such as in the Karatubes uh, cases, uh, in Quiberax, of course, uh, which is a very rich source uh, on interim measures. And so this is to say that as a first step, raising a broad blanket concept of parties equality will not be obviously sufficient. It is not you when you come to criminal proceedings, you are in a case where the clear inequality of parties in investment arbitrations uh, that was mentioned and explained uh, in introduction, this clear imbalance and inequality is is obvious, present, and cannot be corrected totally. So what you're going to be correcting are, or what you're going to try to correct are the effects on the process itself, rather than the mere concept of this inequality existing. So uh, looking at the, the various um, decisions of tribunals on interim measures, you can see a few um, clear uh, criteria uh, that are aimed at framing uh, those claims and framing the decisions on interim measures. So the first one is clearly a connection between the arbitration and the criminal proceedings. In some cases, it was very obvious. Sometimes there were actually documents or statements that expressly confirmed the connection. In some cases, obviously, it's less obvious. Uh, investors can try to show that timing shows, for instance, a retaliation or a reaction, at least, to the investment arbitration. Then, very importantly, is the, the fact that the interim measure must afford protection to a protected right, an identified right. So here we've seen a lot of rights being raised by uh, investors, some of them more relevant than others, in my opinion. Uh, I would put that the most uh, relevant right to be protected is the right to procedural integrity, um, because it is a very specific right that provides and has uh, practical consequences. So you will have the, the procedural integrity through uh, the right to present your case without undue interference with evidence, with counsel, uh, and the right to the protection of the effectiveness of the award. Other rights have been raised, such as the right to preserve the statu quo or non-aggravation of disputes which has been raised quite efficiently as well, might, might be a little bit different in notion because obviously criminal proceedings per se cannot be seen as aggravating the dispute, the investment dispute. So it's a little bit uh, of a more sliding uh, scale. Um, other ones that I, I think are less relevant would be the exclusivity of uh, exit arbitration, the Article 26 of the Convention, or even sometimes parties try to raise the general idea of equality of parties, and that wasn't very efficient as well, because as we said, the inequality is inherent in this topic. And finally, obviously, the measure must be necessary, urgent, and proportional. And here again, uh, especially when, with the proportionality and the balance of interest, um, whether there is an abuse or a misuse can become relevant, but might not be the, a strict condition to 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 order the interim measure, um, you can you can absolutely have a tribunal that would consider that you have a you have criminal proceedings. You are at the inter interim measure stage, so the tribunal has to decide quite promptly. Has to decide on the basis of a limited um, record, and the the natural choice would be to shift the discussion on abuse of or misuse 
But the question can very well be if you can step back, not really look at the issue through the misuse and the abuse, but actually just consider the practical implications and raise interim measures request to correct these very practical um, implications, even if then the, the mere existence of the criminal proceedings could become a claim in and of itself at the merit stage uh, from the process itself, it's more to re -ensure, to ensure that the balance is protected as much as possible as far as how the investor can provide and present its claim. Um, so I would put that maybe an area of discussion is whether just like the commission, you want to stick to the misuse or, and the abuse of uh, the criminal proceedings. This is obviously also um, here in the commission uh, report um, this is obviously the limitations of works of several parties. You, you, you cannot provide blunt statements uh, that are very broad, so you have to frame them. So the, 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 the constraints are understood, but the discussion could be whether you want to limit the case to misuse and abuses or whether practical consideration should be uh, really the heart of the topic. And that could lead to requests that are more tailor-made, such as access to documents, granting uh, the right to receive copies, ensuring uh, that there are undertakings from the states as far as the, the treatment of witnesses, allowing written statements and no physical presence, etc., uh, for witnesses. Uh, and I think I will conclude here. I apologize, I was a little bit long. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Laura, uh, for the comprehensive overview of the topic, and uh, no apologies needed at all. Um, so yeah, you you touched upon um, uh, many issues, and one of which which I find particularly interesting is is how to balance uh, the inequality. And this is also something that that Toby touched upon uh, when there's a parallel proceeding uh, between, you know, particularly a parallel criminal proceeding, where a investor uh, who faces such charges before an investment tribunal may not have the same protections or rights as a criminal defendant would uh, in uh, in criminal proceedings in the domestic setting. So I, I, you touched upon a few things, access uh, to documents, potentially having um, certain evidence struck from the record. Um, I put this to you and, of course, anyone else on the panel who, who, who would like to intervene. Are there other, can we think of any other protections or, or avenues or means that might be granted to an investor uh, facing accusations of corruption, fraud, bribery, uh, or the like in an investment tribunal? Um, you know, thinking outside of the box, what other kinds of means could we grant, could a tribunal grant? To a to an investor um, in, in order to be able to defend itself against such claims in an in an in an investment uh, treaty arbitration. Well, I'd say there are two aspects. Actually, well, several aspects, but two uh, very important ones that are to be distinguished. There's first the real merits of the claim, and uh, for instance, the fact that litigants in criminal proceedings are, are afforded the right to the presumption of innocence, uh, not being guilty before uh, counsel, etc. This is something where the rules applicable to the tribunal and the evidence before it uh, will take over, meaning that even if uh, obviously tribunals are educated, uh, are not going to be uh, impressed by just the fact that criminal proceedings are pending, hopefully not. And so the question will be if there are allegations, for instance, of corruption or criminal uh, criminal uh, behavior uh, on the part of the investor and that it is raised by the state, the, the, the arbitral tribunal will uh, focus on the evidence before it to decide whether or not uh, it finds that the, the, the allegations are sufficiently uh, proven. Then the questions of other uh, other protections and mostly that are mostly procedural protections. I think this is where uh, the practical solutions can become uh, very relevant because it's not so much the pending uh, criminal proceedings in and of themselves that are the problem. It's what they imply for the state and its position in the arbitration. For instance, if you have 
um, a problem because the state has gained access to all documents and is on and is uh, doing a criminal investigation with interviews of various witnesses that the state has access to and obviously uh, will uh, more easily uh, reach than maybe an arbitral tribunal. Uh, you could consider um, require requiring the state that the state provide access to all the investigation file, which is usually the case uh, in a in a criminal uh, proceedings. Uh, if you are the person targeted by the investigation, grant access to the entire investigation file um, in case in case the state wants to produce a document from the investigation file, even maybe justifying why uh, this document has to be produced for the purpose of the arbitration, allowing access to uh, the witnesses that the state would put forward through just pure reports uh, that are uh, produced in the criminal investigation. So that could be uh, a way of ensuring that the state does not benefit unduly as far as the process is concerned from the, the fact that there is a criminal investigation that could require very specific and tailor-made uh, measures, uh, procedural orders, uh, most likely by the tribunal to ensure that the, the investor will not be prejudiced or not too much by the fact that there are ongoing procedural uh, ongoing criminal proceedings. Yes, thanks very much. And um, I think one other uh, potential uh, means of, of uh, sort of rebalancing the inequality uh, comes to mind. Uh, you mentioned we worked on a case together. And uh, in that case, um, we sought, so, so part of the evidence introduced uh, by the state was uh, a number of witness statements uh, submitted in the criminal proceedings. And one application was made to to have all those witnesses uh, come before the, the tribunal, uh, the investment tribunal, to be cross-examined uh, by the investor. Now, whether that uh, is something that's feasible uh, is another question. Uh, for, you know, for sort of technical issues, that didn't happen in this case. Um, so. Moving on to another question, and I might put this uh, first to Harshad, is whether this whole topic uh, is affected by the, uh, I guess, trend towards uh, increased uh, pleas, uh, jurisdictional pleas aimed at, um, at dismissing claims on the base of corruption, um, uh, infecting the investment and therefore rendering it inadmissible or, or, or rejecting for lack of jurisdiction. Now, as we've seen, there's a movement in a number of cases. We could we could say metal tech, for example, where uh, arbitrators have called for what could be described as a lower standard of proof, uh, or at least a lower standard of proof than in, um, uh, in criminal proceedings uh, at the domestic level, sort of a balance of probability standard, uh, including uh, you know, a concept such as so-called red flags. Um, so I'll put this to, to Harshad, and it would also be interesting to hear from anyone else, but also perhaps, perhaps Toby uh, as, as the most experienced arbitrator amongst us. Does this trend, and particularly uh, if it does indeed calls for a lower uh, uh, standard of proof, um, mean that we need to be more vigilant about uh, about recalibrating this uh, inequality between the state and its criminal investigation powers on one hand and, and the investor on the other hand. So I'll put that question first. Uh, First to Harshad, and then, of course, uh, to Toby or anyone else who might have thoughts on that. Thank you, uh, Will. Uh, to answer that question, I think the, the starting point must be that even outside of ISDS, even in commercial arbitration, states or company or state-controlled companies have always taken exception to allegations of corruption or any other illegality or bad faith conduct involved in the transaction that may be the subject matter of dispute. Uh, to put things in context, independent of the illegality uh, jurisdiction objection, 
there is a rich history in common law and that's applied in a lot of uh, arbitrations governed by both Indian law and common law principles of the doctrine of unclean hands. So states have always used conduct of the claimant, be it an investor or a contracting party, to its advantage, either at the stage of jurisdiction or admissibility. I think it's the same tendency that is being brought to the ISDS framework, aggravated by the fact, and I guess we'll discuss this later on, that ISDS is a framework in which states don't have a clear standing to level allegations against the investors or put forth substantive claims as counterclaims. So there are only limited avenues in investment treaty arbitration where it's not the state's conduct, but it's rather the investment investor's conduct at the time of making a continuation of the investment that is really the subject matter of the inquiry. Uh, so these factors, coupled with what you rightly mentioned, uh, I wouldn't say a lowering of standard, but more like uh, because it's at the end of the day a proceeding which is a civil nature. So a standard of red flags approach, balance of probabilities, which makes these objections more tenable. These factors together, I think, would justify why we see an increase in uh, the number of illegality or bad faith conduct based objections taken by four states. Uh, because really, I think as Toby rightly indicated uh, during his opening speech that ISDS has become a framework where the investor needs to succeed only once in the, in the bouquet of parallel proceedings that can be initiated. But as the state always feels the pressure of having to justify the same conduct again and again in domestic law and international law. So this is one of the rare avenues where it can put the spotlight on the investor and hope to get the best result out of it. Thanks very much uh, for that answer, Hashad. And uh, I think any brief uh, comments on that last point from uh, from Toby or, or, or Gabriele before we move on to the next topic? Uh, I, I will uh, just just briefly. It's slightly sensitive because of a number of live cases, actually. But uh, the um, I, I think that I, I would personally caution against any general statement on the approach to parallel criminal proceedings in the context of corruption challenges or challenges to jurisdiction based on corruption or illegality, uh, because I, I have seen uh, many many different cases, different configurations where different approaches are needed. Uh, there are approaches where a tribunal will be comfortable in deferring to criminal proceedings and will actually say that they, uh, there are no doubts about them uh, and that it's appropriate to let the criminal proceedings run their course and that can be fed into the tribunal deliberations and like the, the tribunal's uh, process at some stage. There are other cases where there are doubts about the criminal proceeding, where there are feelings of uh, a lack of good faith or a problem in terms of its timing or its motivation. Um, there are cases where there are doubts about the viability, reliability of the local process. Um, and then there are also timing issues where um, there are cases where a tribunal is called upon to look at a concluded process as opposed to a pending process locally. And I think the, the problem I have with a sort of general red flags approach is I don't think it works in every case. There are some cases where it's appropriate to say that all we can do is look for red flags and that's sufficient. And I think there are other cases where that's insufficient because of the circumstances. Actually, it's just not good enough to say, well, red flags, because you've got enough evidence available and you can actually go further and you need to go further. So that, that is to say, I'm afraid, I think that um, it, it's, a, it's a field where it really has to be done. It has to be addressed case by case. Thank you very much for that, Toby. And um, given the, the time remaining, I think we should now move on to the next topic to be introduced by Harshad, which has been um, already uh, alluded to by Toby in his introductory remarks. And that is this specific issue of, of counterclaims and, and uh, within the framework of equality of parties. So please uh, take the floor, Harshad. Thank you, Will. Uh, right. So the topic that I have to introduce uh, pertains to the role of counterclaims in ISDS, particularly for maintaining this equality of parties before international investment tribunal. And I believe that the starting point of this discussion has to be an acknowledgement of the historical context uh, behind how international investment tribunals came into being and 
what were the intentions uh, behind the creation of such a framework in the mid 20th century? Now, there's sufficient literature which indicates with ample reason that the emergence of international investment law and investment treaty arbitration coincided with the gradual decline of the colonial era in the mid 20th century. So it's in this context that one of the important goals of IIL was to create an enforceable supranational legal order that could facilitate a steady flow of investments from the capital exporting states to the newly importing, uh, newly independent capital importing states, including states such as India. Uh, this was largely necessitated for two reasons. First, the perceived inadequacies in the municipal laws of these newly independent states, belonging largely to the global south as we recognize it today. And secondly, the deficiencies in the principles of customary international law themselves on aspects of foreign investment, including determination of what is uh, just, fair, and re reasonable compensation. So in this background, the investment law framework that emerged, let's say post-conclusion of the first BIT between Pakistan and Germany in 1959, its intention, or it, it only envisaged one claimant that was supposed to be the investor, and the host state was very much by design the perennial respondent. And it was in this context that most of the first and second generation treaties were negotiated and almost exclusively between the global south and the global north economies. We move on a few decades and we see increasing number of the ISDS cases. Uh, and then uh, we come to the past decade or so, which is witnessing a sort of backlash against ISDS resulting in termination of treaties and denunciation of the exit convention by some states. Now, not many deny the existing of the existence of such a backlash. What we can see, all, uh, of course, is that it may have started in certain geographical regions, let's say Latin America. But today, this sentiment against ISDS is also moved on to continents of Asia, Africa, and even EU in the context of intra-EU disputes. And many say the reason for this is that States like Germany and USA are today as likely to be sued by foreign investors as in India or in Argentina in the past. Now, why is this context relevant? And I think there are two systemic reasons which make it appropriate for today's discussion, which have nothing to do with principles of treaty interpretation. And these reasons, firstly, is that the notion of counterclaims in ISDS has the potential to alleviate some of these biases of international investment law and therefore arrest this increasing backlash. To this extent, the notion of counterclaims is not just a theoretical or a legal question, but it plays a role in ensuring possibly over the next few decades the global sustenance of ISDS that we've sort of come, become used to. The second reason is that the notion of counterclaims can also allow the framework of international investment law to at least attempt to move away from its post-colonial origins and adapt to what we see the changing definitions of what is a capital exporting country and what is a capital importing country. Therefore, none of this suggests that counterclaims for strictly legal reasons are necessary within the existing ISTS framework. I think to be very well explained that international investment law creates a sort of a vertical form of dispute settlement where an investor ideally is limited to challenging the exercise of sovereign powers of the state. From this perspective, one can say that the two litigants are differently placed, and it's perfectly fine if states don't have the ability to advance counterclaim in ISTS proceedings. They have their executive powers under municipal law. They have access to the local forums within their own territory. Yet, the commission considered it important, the 18th commission considered it important to still study the issue of counterclaims in ISDS and determine, does it still have some relation to the principle of equality? It answered this question in the affirmative, and uh, it's not difficult to identify where the answers lie. The resolution passed in 2019 by the 18th Commission. There are two articles which clarify the position. The first is Article 6.1 titled Counterclaims, which says that the ability of a respondent to assert a counterclaim that is admissible before a tribunal ensures the procedural equality of the parties. And procedural equality is one of the important tenets of uh, the overarching principle of equality in any adjudicatory proceeding, including investor state. 
And then there's Article 2.1 in the resolution passed in 2019, titled Access, which clearly states that both the state and the investor are equally entitled to submit a claim in relation to an investment to a tribunal, subject to the terms of the instrument of consent, interpreted in accordance with the principle of equality of parties. Now, it's the last proposition recorded in Article 2.1 that, that, that's quite intriguing. And I say that because the equal entitlement to submit a claim before an investment treaty tribunal sort of contradicts, although it's accurate as we, as we speak today, it sort of contradicts the why and the how of I, how the ISDS framework came into being in the mid 20th century with the decline of the colonial era. Now, this poses a dichotomy, a question that in today's world, where many of the first and second generation investment treaties continue to operate either uh, on their own because they are yet to be terminated or because of the sunset clauses that exist in such treaties. How does one attain the procedural equality in the context of counterclaims that has also been uh, advocated by the 18th Commission uh, of International Law Association? I I'll keep this section brief, but the critical step in determining how to attain this procedural equality and then from the perspective of counterclaims is to first determine what is the correct mechanism for a tribunal to assess if counterclaims fall within the jurisdiction of an investment treaty tribunal. Now, there are two ways suggested by arbitral tribunals in the past and have been acknowledged by the 18th Commission. They are the narrow approach or the broader approach. Now, the narrow approach, which seems to be more popular, it suggests that the language of investment treaties retains primacy to determine whether counterclaims are within the jurisdiction of an investment treaty tribunal. For example, if an investment treaty dispute resolution provision states that it's only an investor who can bring a claim, uh, then that could be read as the intention of the contracting parties to not allow for counterclaims. And this also follows from Article 2.1 of the 18th Commission's resolution, which says that the equal entitlement that the state and investors have to submit claims remains subject to the terms of the instrument of consent, which would be the treaty that is invoked in the first place. And this is confirmed by Article 6.3, which says that the jurisdictional requirement is met when by virtue of the instrument of consent invoked by the respondent, the tribunal would have had jurisdiction over the counterclaim had it been asserted as a primary claim. The problem with this narrow approach, and it creates sizable obstacles, because most of the first and second generation treaties, as we discussed in the beginning, were actually created, negotiated with an objective to have only one claimant, that is the investor, and one respondent, that is the state. Therefore, one cannot on the one hand, theoretically proclaim that host state should today have an equal entitlement to advance counterclaims, but on the other hand, do not pay attention to what the content of these first and second generation treaties is and how that came into being. Uh, this then creates a problem. What is the alternative, if not the narrow approach? Well, the alternative can lie in the broader approach, which is a line of opinion that suggests that notwithstanding the language of an investment treaty invoked, where the parties consent to an instrument, such as the exit convention, or even other institutional rules, which contemplate counterclaims by a respondent. And an investor by invoking the treaty in question agrees or opts for one of these institutional rules. Then the investor's double consent includes an acceptance that it can be subject, it can face certain counterclaims advanced by a host state. It's not the most popular approach, but there have been a decision or two. I think most notably there's a declaration of uh, Professor Michael Reisman in Rosales versus Romania. And it's been followed by uh, the tribunal in uh, Antoine Gates versus Burundi, which say that even if the treaty language doesn't explicitly or implicitly contemplate counterclaims, selection of exit convention is sufficient for the tribunal to establish jurisdiction. And the 18th Commission also seems to suggest that this can be a way out because it says that acceptance of a too narrower construction could undermine an important procedural aspect of the equality of parties by excluding any possibility of the international investment tribunals having jurisdiction over a counterclaim, and this is not a desirable conclusion. And why does the commission say that this is not a desirable uh, solution? Because unless one adopts a broader approach, 
it's, it's, it's all right if states make peace with the fact that they're okay with not having the entitlement to advance counterclaims. But if they do want to advance counterclaims and the narrow approach is the preferred approach, is the approach preferred by arbitral tribunals, then the only remaining alternative requires either an amendment or even a termination of the existing treaties to be eventually replaced by treaties which have broad dispute resolution clauses that either expressly or implicitly envisage the possibility of counterclaims, which envisage that the claim that the investor need not be the only claimant and also impose obligations, not just on the contracting states, but also the investor making an investment in such states. Uh, and to conclude on this, it's not to say that there aren't any other obstacles, particularly concerning admissibility that are relevant to this discussion. But the first and the most critical step be, uh, be, uh, belongs to the domain of jurisdiction, because unless the jurisdiction of a tribunal to entertain counterclaims is established, any discussion as to the admissibility constraints uh, may be slightly premature. So I think this, uh, this could be uh, a way for us to carry forward the discussion. Uh, Will, I hand it back to you. Uh, Alina, well, sorry. up to me. <laughs> to you, Alina. Thank you. Thank you, Harshad. This is, this is really very helpful. Um, thank you so much. Uh, now, it, it would really seem from what you say that, that a quick fix, or, or, or at least the most obvious way to allow for a counterclaim by states would be to explicitly provide for such mechanism in the new generation treaties. But we actually looked at those new generation treaties and we haven't seen any you know, um, explicit provision um, which would allow for such possibility. And I was wondering whether you, Harshad, or, 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 or our panelists today uh, would be aware of, of any, any, any of these treaties and having seen such a provision. Uh, but, well, uh, I'll answer that. Uh, I agree with what you said. It, it's, it's difficult, if possibly impossible, to find a treaty which explicitly envisages counterclaims. But there are a few signs yeah. in there. Uh, for example, in India, there was a first version, first draft of the model Indian BIT in 2015, which had an article 14.2 that expressly stipulated that a tribunal jurisdiction would also extend to counterclaims by uh, made by a respondent state against an investor. And it also imposed substantive obligations on an uh, investor. Now, the next revised draft of the model BIT, unfortunately or fortunately, removed this particular express language. And that is the basis of the new treaties that India is negotiating. That being said, you still have examples such as Article 10 of the Argentina Spain BIT, which was the treaty in question in Urban Services Argentina, I believe, which doesn't expressly contemplate counterclaims, but its language is broad enough for a tribunal to reach a conclusion that counterclaims are not excluded by the contracting parties. Uh, and that might be a more plausible way forward because based upon the experiences that we are seeing, at least in India, in the, some of the treaty negotiations that are going on, it is not easy for to have two states, both of which uh, agree to a treaty provision explicitly uh, contemplating counterclaims. So the implicit recognition may be the way forward. But I'm happy to, I'm happy to myself find out if there's any other treaty that expressly contemplates counterclaim. I haven't seen that either. To our knowledge, uh, there aren't, but but I don't know whether um, uh, other panelists would like to chip in and perhaps provide us with their views or or maybe we can move on to the next um, question uh, and also subtopic because uh, we don't there's we have very little time on our hands and uh, and and we would really like to hear Gabriele on uh, on the equality of parties in the composition of tribunals. Perhaps we'll leave, um, we do have many questions for you and, and I do hope uh, our participants would also address your, the questions in the Q&A chat. We received a few already, um, but before we move on to the questions, Gabriele, you have the floor. Would you like to, to share with us your views on the um, equality of parties in the composition of the tribunals? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the, for the invitation to all of you and for the organization of this uh, very interesting um, event. Um, so my, my topic, the topic of today or my intervention is the uh, composition of the arbitral tribunals and the um, equality of the parties in the composition of the adjudicatory bodies uh, in the new proposed systems of investor state arbitration. Um, now, before um, um, before talking about that, I would like to um, simply list a few um, elements that um, 
let's say, refer to the origins of uh, the uh, creation of the, or the proposal of these new reforms of the investor state um, uh, system in relation to the composition of the adjudicatory bodies. Um, first of all, we start um, the origin of this reform, start with some criticism of against uh, uh, the actual, the current system. Um, criticism that arise uh, um, concerning the lack of independence and impartiality of arbitrators because they were re remunerated for the specific ad hoc services um, for which they are appointed. Um, other criticisms uh, refer to uh, the uh, double hatting um, of the arbitrators, so some of them they act as counsels and arbitrators together. Does this create um, issues such as issue conflicts and so on? And then we had another set of critics that refer to the structural features of the of the system, um, the lack of consistency, um, because sometimes arbitral tribunals reach different uh, uh, and inconsistent solutions um, regarding issues such as the most favored nations clause, the umbrella clauses, and so on. Um, we have uh, arbitrations, especially in the investor state sector, that became very long and very costly. Um, there is a lack of appropriate control um, mechanism um, uh, after the final award is issued. Um, and there is also lack or an alleged lack of transparency. Um, the decision basically taken um, uh, and impacting by the arbitral tribunals and impacting on public interests are made, um, someone says, um, uh, behind closed doors. So all these critics um, led to serious concerns um, about the democratic accountability and legitimacy of the dispute resolution process. And the reform uh, proposed um, uh, ta tried to tackle the issues um, through three different um, uh, strategies. The first one is the amendments of arbitration rules. The, first, the second one is the insertion of uh, transparency provisions in, uh, in international investment agreements. And the third um, is the global adoption, for instance, of the UNCTRA rules of transparency and the Mauritius Convention. Now, these proposals have positive um, aspects of so, and, and uh, of course, and negative ones as well. The positive aspects um, uh, include, for instance, the improving of consistency, the predictability and the legal correctness of the decision the enhancing of the um, awards authority and the restoration of the regime's credibility and legitimacy, the achieving of a high level of harmonization and consistency of international investment law, even if there will be, um, it would be impossible to reach a full harmonization um, of the system. And then the, also the fact that the tenure judges would give um, probably a higher guarantee of independence and impartiality. This is what people and scholars wrote about the positive elements of the reforms. And then we have the negative elements that could be, for instance, the lack of flexibility, expert decision making, speed and enforceability, the increase of costs and length of the proceedings, because of course, if we have other ways to challenge the arbitral award than the ones that we have today, this would create uh, longer proceedings. Um, the search for finality, which is a very important concept in international arbitration, would um, be opposed to the search of uh, quality, for quality um, of the award. Um, the appeal, any kind of appeal, either to an appellate mechanism or to a multilateral, um, to a multinational um, um, investment court, would become probably the rule because each party would try at least to challenge uh, the decision of the first instance award. Um, and then um, decision increase increasingly exposed, of course, to debate, um, criticism. And more specifically, um, with regard to our topic of today, there will be an abandonment, an abandonment of the um, uh, institution of the party appointment and um, the um, appointment of the judges by the states, because this is what would, would happen in a new system, could of course raise issues of uh, impartiality. Um, now, uh, this um, free um, uh, this, 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 these issues lead me to um, uh, three conceptual consequences of the proposed reforms. The first one is a transition, as I mentioned, from um, a disputing party ad hoc framework um, to a treaty party permanent or semi-permanent framework. 
The second uh, point is the increased complexity in the process of the selection of the uh, um, adjudicators, of the arbitrators, or judges, because there is, again, there is a problem of wording and definitions. And the third point is a very uh, heavy formalization, formalization of the uh, composition uh, process. Now, um, what happened today, what happens today is that we have uh, the two concepts, um, equality of treatment, um, and equality of treatment can be defined as having the um, uh, arbitrators or the adjudicators completely independent and impartial vis-a-vis -vis the parties, and the equality of the appointment, meaning that each party can appoint or nominate its own co-arbitrator, have the same rank. So these two concepts today are fully protected by the current system. Um, Let's see, for instance, the ICSID and the ICC nomination processes. The ICSID process has only one uh, limitation, which is um, Article, uh, sorry, Rule 1.3 of the ICSID arbitration rules that states that the majority of the arbitrators shall be nationals of states other than the state party to the dispute and of the state whose national is a party to the dispute, unless the sole arbitrator of each individual member of the tribunal is appointed by agreement of the parties. So this is a limitation of the ICSID rules as to the nationality. But otherwise, um, each party can nominate its own uh, co-arbitrator. The same happens with the ICC, within the ICC rules. We have actually, since 2021, a new provision with the rules, the new rules um, applicable from the 1st of January. A new provision, Article 13.6, that states that whenever the arbitration agreement upon which the arbitration is based arises from a treaty, and unless the parties agree otherwise, no arbitrator shall have the same nationality of any party. And that provision applies also for the um, um, party nominated arbitrator, co-arbitrators. So we have, I would say, of course, I'm going to simplify a lot um, uh, the process, but I would say that the um, two main uh, conditions um, of the selection process, both under ICSID and under ICC rules, are the independence and impartiality of the arbitrators, and some limitations as regards the um, 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 uh, as regards the nationality of the arbitrators in, of course, as far as ICC is concerned, um, BIT uh, disputes. Now, um, when the parties um, nominate their co-arbitrators, they also select other um, elements or they consider ele other elements, such as the competence of the um, uh, adjudicators, of the arbitrators. So they want to select someone who is competent in a specific um, uh, applicable law or um, who is uh, competent, who has a lot of experience in um, uh, a specific industry sector that is um, at the core of the dispute. Um, now, the proposed design um, and reforms for the bodies, and this is very well highlighted also by uh, the rap uh, rapporteur and by the resolution of the Institut de droit international that we are discussing, um, changes a little bit uh, this situation and kind of downgrades the principle of equality of appointment. Um, and it's very clear from the, from the rap report um, that we have read that the impartiality of the members of an international investment tribunal is an indispensable prerequisite to the equality of the parties as it is for any tribunal. So the level equal treatment as far as to, as regards to independence and impartiality stays very high and stays there at the same level um, where it was before. However, the, in the case of a permanent international tribunal, and I'm using the words of the rapporteur, the principle of the equality of the parties does not require that each party retain the ability to appoint a judge. The overriding consideration is the independence and impartiality of the judicial body. And again, equality as an attribute of the universally recognized right to a fair trial does not include as an essential component a right to appoint members of the tribunal. This is not a requirement of standing courts and tribunals, whether at the national or at the international level. The equality of arms is an overstatement. The issue is one of the proper design of the constitution of such a tribunal, not the fact of its creation. Um, 
therefore, as, as I mentioned before, the equality of appointment is no longer an overriding principle under the new system. And the rapport, the rapporteur and the resolution highlights um, both highlight this, this issue. So the, 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 the next question is um, no longer whether this is correct or not. Uh, at least this is my, my opinion is that we are probably going to change the system. The, change, the system will be another one in a decade or so. And therefore the, 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 the very the core question should be how can we ensure that the constitution and the composition of the bodies deciding over um, ISDS uh, dispute um, is made properly, not whether it should be made as it is made today or whether the system is, um, or the, whether the reforms are correct or not. So in order to understand uh, which is the proper design for the constitution and composition of the bodies, scholars um, have uh, discussed several issues to, uh, to consider. Um, the first issue is the composition in terms of numbers. How many people do we need? Do we need a full representation or do we need a selective representation? And there, of course, we have to, um, to uh, check whether the system is applicable to a bilateral um, uh, fed, a free trade agreement or international investment agreement or to a more multilateral broader um, uh, body. If it's also, if, if it, of course, if it is in a situation of a bilateral agreement, we are fine because the uh, representation of, of each uh, nationality is quite easy. If we are in a system in, in, a, in a broader appellate mechanism, for instance, or in a multilateral, in a multilateral investment court, um, the issue becomes more uh, difficult. Um, and that's where probably elements of diversity that I will discuss in a couple of, in a few minutes, will enter um, into uh, the discussions. Then the, the second question is, do we need a roster system or do we need a permanent system? Or can we actually have both in the same, within the same system? Um, and a very interesting example may be, for instance, the WTO dispute settlement body in which we have a first instance of panelists um, that can be chosen from a roster system and then we have a stable or a permanent body um, as the appellate body um, that is designed to um, uh, represent the different geographical areas and legal backgrounds um, of the state's members to the WTO. Um, now we have, the, that, then we have who is going, whom is going to participate um, as an adjudicator. Um, and there we have several elements that should be taken into account. The first one is the competence. Um, and there um, the question is, is the knowledge of public international law or international investment law enough um, to um, uh, you know, decide whether um, a person can be included in a roster or can be included in a um, system of arbitrators or in a multilateral investment court um, and so on? Or do we need also other um, uh, competencies, other knowledge uh, that these people should have? And there, there is the first uh, difference between what we have today and what we could have in the future. Today, if we are in a construction dispute, both claimant and respondent, even when respondent or state, would like to have probably an arbitrator who is specialized in construction. Do we have the same possibility when we are in a permanent um, uh, body um, of uh, judges selected by a state. The second point is diversity. Diversity that should be a geographical diversity, a, a, a diversity of legal systems, um, diversity of nationalities, diversity of gender, and so on. So how, and that's linked to the first point, how many people, how is it possible to have a good representation of adjudicators in these new um, bodies. The third point is the independence. Um, and the independence should be both structural and individual. Structural um, means that there should be an absence of external influence on the institution or the dispute settlement body. Individual independence means that sh there should be a complete absence of connections between a disputing party and the adjudicator. And there, in order to 
you know, uh, ensure proper um, or ensure the uh, compliance of the independence standard, um, uh, several issues should intervene, such as the selection methodology, the security of the tenure um, of the mandate, the terms of the office, the financial security that, that should be given to uh, the judges, the adequate resources, incompatibilities with other activities, privileges and immunities, and also, of course, rules to the assignment of the cases to each of the members of the um, um, uh, new tribunals. Um, and then we have, of course, the impartiality issue that is the subjective element, and that includes other issues such as issue conflicts, repeat appointments, and so on. Now, an interesting, um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, criticism towards the current uh, system is the repeated appointment. Some people say uh, we always see some arbitrators um, acting for investors, some arbitrators acting for states, uh, many arbitrators are always uh, selected and nominated by the same state, and so on. But if we position ourselves in a new system of, for instance, roster um, um, uh, panels, or roster uh, panels based on roster system, um, we might have again the same issue. We might have again um, states that are going to always nominate from that roster the same arbitrator. An investor might do the same. So we also need, the system should also consider this, this issue um, that are similar to the ones that we have today. And then we have the nationality element. And the nationality element is interesting because not even the resolution of the um, uh, Institut de Droit International um, finds a, a clear um, um, or takes a clear position. Um, there we have people who state that in the new bodies, in the new tribunals, they should be constituted under the uh, new FDIs, uh, FTAs or new um, uh, multilateral treaties. Um, we should ensure that the two parties uh, to a proceedings, to an arbitration proceedings, or the nationalities of the two parties are reflected in the composition of the new adjudicatory body. Um, which means, for instance, that if uh, we have a Brazilian party um, and against a Brazilian investor against a Spanish uh, state, for instance, we must be sure that judges, a judge from Brazil and a judge from Spain, is um, present in the um, uh, tribunal. And if we are in a permanent system in which, for instance, Brazil is not represented, whereas Spain it is, then we should have an ad hoc judge system, um, thanks to which the Brazilian government, or the Brazilian investor, sorry, can have an ad hoc judge from Brazil represented in the bench. Um, the other approach is different, is the opposite, and states that if we have one over, I mean, if we have only one of the parties represented in the system by a judge, that judge should be excused. And so uh, we should not have any nationality of the parties represented in the uh, body. Um, then, um, and, and these are my last two points, um, how should the new mechanism, either an appellate mechanism or the multi a multinational uh, investment court, how should they be uh, composed and how the arbitrator should be selected? And there, in order to ensure that, um, you know, principles such as independence, neutrality, impartiality are fully complied with, um, the proposals um, are uh, the following. First of all, we should have a multi-layered process, and the multi-layered process should include um, uh, the selection, the, co the, the candidacy and the nomination, uh, the consultation of the advisory body that has to take a decision, the screening of the people who are um, uh, sending their application to become judges uh, for these new um, tribunals and bodies, and then the election of uh, or, or the appointment of these of these people. The second point, and that's the point that was raised by one of the members of the Institut de Droit International, and that is very well highlighted in the report, is that since we are going to have um, uh, 
bodies, adjudicatory bodies, composed by um, arbitrators or judges that are selected by the state at the end of the day, we should have um, an open um, uh, uh, discussion with all the stakeholders involved in the sector, not only the investors, uh, but also other uh, stakeholders, such as um, uh, uh, civil uh, servants, public, um, uh, the, the society, the public um, uh, people who might have um, an impact on the procedures or who might be impacted by your decisions of these um, adjudicatory bodies. And then, um, of course, we have the last issue, which is the longer um, and non-renewable terms that should be assigned to these new judges versus the shorter um, and renewable ones. And I think that the tendency is towards the first um, option. So having longer uh, terms that are not renewable um, after um, uh, the first one. Now, um, my conclusions um, are the following. Um, the, first, first of all, uh, there is, of course, a, an issue of, um, you know, the, the party appointment arbitrator is, is a very important issue in, in, in international arbitration. Now, is it correct to downgrade this principle and to say that it's not an override principle um, or a mandatory one in international arbitration? Well, we it's very different. The investor state system is probably very different from all the other ones. But if we made a comparison with the human rights system that we have today, um, we might find that Courts, let's take for instance the European Court of Human Rights, um, are standing permanent bodies um, who that decide um, on um, disputes between individuals and states. So if we make this comparison, I'm not fully convinced that we can make this comparison because the investor state system is very different. But if we want to make this comparison, we can see that at the end of the day, the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights are as impartial and independent as probably they would be if the investor or if the individual could uh, pick or could select its own um, uh, judge or arbitrator. So probably if we respect all the elements that I listed before in the decision of the, of the judges, we might have final decisions that are as impartial and as independent as the ones that we have today, which are not perfect, but they balance the interest of uh, the investor and the states. And my very last point is the issue of uh, depoliticization. And um, we, the, the, you know, the criticism to, these, uh, to, to the old system that we had previous to the one that we have now was that there was too much politics in the decision on investor state disputes. Let's remember the diplomatic protection and so on. Uh, the uh, criticism that we have today, the critics that we have today, um, are more related to the fact that the adjudicators are, or appears to be sometimes too pro-investors, um, more than uh, being pro-states. And that the system is too commercial, the system is too business oriented, and doesn't take into account the public interest. Now, what happens in, in, in the future? What happens? Is politics going to be um, a very important element again? My answer is, of course, yes. Um, if we have states, we're going to have a very huge impact on the decisions of the judges in this new system, in these new bodies. Of course, the states are going to have um, a very strong presence um, in, 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 in such a nomination process and will try to of course, propose the people that they consider to be appropriate for their and, and responding to their interests um, as well. And I think that it's in particular important if we look at the composition of a multilateral investment court, when most probably not all the states will be able to be represented. And I think that for such an important issue, such as the protection of investors, of investments all over the world, the state will try to have um, a very um, a strong uh, voice and will apply probably more political pressures um, in the composition of this um, of these courts. Now, the issue will be, are these people elected, nominated by states, 
going to apply more uh, political um, uh, reasonings or more um, and, and take more political decisions. This we don't know. And probably one of the um, um, examples that could um, reject this idea of, depoli of future depoliticization uh, is the decision that was taken very recently by um, the International Court of Justice that um, unanimously decided to have jurisdiction over claims that were brought um, by the Iranian uh, government against the Gabriele, United States. Gabriele, I'm so sorry. I will have to interrupt that's, you that's all, because that's, we're that's all. really running out of time yeah, and we sure. receive questions in the Q&A and, yeah. and we really like to take some questions. I believe um, we did have a question, a follow-up question on your intervention. We'll, let, let, let's, let's address it and then we would really like to take some questions from the Q&A. Thank you everyone for your patience. We're not going to take you any longer. You know, not, let, let's bear with us for uh, five additional minutes, all right? Will, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriele, for, for that comprehensive overview. And I'd like to just pick up on, on the very helpful distinction you made, which was also made uh, by the Institute in the study and, and resolution between equality of treatment and equality of appointment. Um, as you mentioned, uh, equality of appointment will play less or, or, or no role in the, the proposed MIC. I'm going to assume for the purposes of this question that equality of treatment will still be there. Uh, now, that's obviously a, a subject uh, open to discussion, um, but let's assume it's there, including because of your examples of the Court of Human Rights, and we may also use the ICJ as another example. So my question, uh, first, I will put this uh, and, 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 and knowing full well we're limited to time. Uh, from the perspective of the investor. How important is it? Uh, how important is the equality of appointment and the ability to be able to choose an arbitrator uh, as opposed to equality of treatment, um, especially the fact of not being judged before the host state court? Um, will investors still make use of this new uh, mechanism? without the equality of appointment or the ability to choose their own arbitrator? Uh, will that um, uh, also influence where they invest because of this, because of protection provided by the MIG? So I'll, I'll put that to you, Gabriele, and, and then if we have time, uh, to Laura from the investor side. Then from the, from the state side, uh, Toby mentioned the difficulties that sometimes arises uh, for states in, in, uh, in selecting arbitrators. Will the removal of this process make life easier for states, or do some states also enjoy uh, the, the, the fact of being able to select their arbitrator and have a role? Uh, and will, will the fact that all arbitrators uh, or adjudicators are now appointed by the states make them more likely to sign up to investment treaties with a MIC style mechanism. So first, from the investor side, uh, Gabriele, uh, put that question to you. And then if we have time, uh, Laura may also want to give her views uh, from an investor's perspective. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Um, um, uh, I think it's it's very important to see how the um, uh, how the, the tribunals or the courts will be composed. Of. I think it's if, if it's there is if there is um, a kind of um, communication and discussion on the composition, also taking into account the investor the investor perspectives. I think that the probably the investor will still um, use uh, this uh, uh, this this dispute settlement mechanisms. And then, of course, we have to remember that probably it will be safer, even if composed of judges uh, selected by states, it will still be safer than going before national courts. So I would probably say that the impartiality and independence um, will still be higher and the investors will still go there. Thanks very much. And Laura, do you have any views, in, including perhaps having spoken to, to investors, uh, clients about this particular issue? Uh, with, with... Sorry. 
Yes, please go ahead. Uh, well, I, to be honest, I had more views on the state side, but I'll do. <laughs> if I may, I, I'll mention it. But then on the investor side, I think it's something that if you look uh, quickly, yes, uh, the appointment will be by states, but the appointment will be done by states. Um, or the, at least the selection will be done by states, bearing in mind uh, their interests. And when I say their interest, it's not only the immediate I'm a state, I, need, I have an interest in defending my state uh, or my sovereign right and going for uh, appointment of people who are more towards uh, a protection of the state sovereignty. Um, it will be also taking into account the fact that their investors have uh, large investments in several countries might require protection, taking into account, even if we're not into, uh, as uh, Hashad was mentioning, even if we're not into the old um, capital importing, exporting uh, dichotomy, we still have uh, states that can easily identify uh, whether they need to make sure that their investors are uh, clearly protected. Uh, so I would think that we, would, we have to move beyond the fact that it's appointed by states, because in the appointment process, the state will take into account various interests uh, for that appointment. And if I may just say something on the state side when I was listening, is that I also think that having uh, advised states uh, in investment arbitration, you, you see uh, the two, two very big hurdles that they face and that were mentioned by Toby uh, in introduction, which is A, often you receive the time it takes to get the request for arbitration up to a council, uh, you, you, you're you very late in the process and sometimes deadline might be looming uh, or have passed and that's a, a problem for states. And second, um, this is an indirect consequence of something uh, Toby was mentioning is that as a state, it is clear if you are in a, each party appointment process, um, the considerations, although the industry is important, uh, the knowledge and the competence in international law, public international law, uh, might be crucial, crucial for the states and for its defense. And you have a very limited panel of people who are not so much uh, going through the spectrum of state favorable to states or investor, but who are really qualified in uh, public international law. And this problem is increasing because we have more and more people from the commercial side coming in, but not that many. Uh, coming in from the public international law side, which might be a limitation also to choose your uh, arbitrator. So that was my quick comments. Thanks very much. And now I'm going to hand over to, to Toby and Hashad. Just a very quick comment before I do so is that I think that uh, claimants sometimes would be better served by choosing uh, arbitrators uh, expert in public international law and not says I mean, necessarily think that a commercially minded arbitrator would be better with uh, their interests. But uh, put, with that aside, uh, uh, Toby, do you have anything to say on this last uh, question? Uh, I would like to think that in time, uh, through probably an initial phases of incredible politics and uh, a very, very difficult time constituting an MIC, it would settle down and states would be comfortable with it. Um, but in the short term, one should bear in mind that many states now are well versed with due diligence in choosing arbitrators. Many of them are very sophisticated, uh, have very sophisticated advisors and may not want to give that up. Uh, and the other problem, of course, is that in investor state arbitration, unlike many other fields, the range of issues are finite. They're limited and they repeat. Uh, and uh, the problem with a standing court is that once it has taken decisions on those limited those limited issues, then they are settled. Uh, and uh, and that that will be uh, that means there's much, much less scope for maneuver for both investors and states. So I think it will take some time for it all to settle down, actually. But ultimately, um, I think it, 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 it probably will be workable. Thank you very much for that, uh, Toby. Harsha, do, do you have anything to add uh, from the state side perspective or, 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 or investor, uh, uh, whichever you feel like, like addressing? Well, uh, from the state side, uh, I just have one comment. Uh, while the issues of international investment law are often finite, sometimes at least the state feels that the dispute is so intertwined with intricacies of domestic law, that there is a preference to have one of the arbitrators at least 
who has a sound understanding in the domestic law of the host state to the extent treaty and the institutional rules permit. And and what Toby indicated in, in his opening, uh, and it's, I, I fully echo that sentiment, that sometimes it's none of the legal considerations influence a state's choice of an arbitrator. Uh, considerations of perception or appointing arbitrators, or rather appoint, not appointing arbitrators from particular nationalities uh, can have an overriding effect and in many cases, it happens that even before councils are appointed, not just sometimes a deadlines is passed, that's still fine. Sometimes councils are appointed in cases where the tribunal already constituted, in which case it's purely the internal uh, experts within the state governments who decide as per their uh, internal parameters who may be the best arbitrator. So states hold their right to appoint an arbitrator sacred, uh, in my experience, and for a variety of legal and political reasons. All right, excellent. So um, we do have two minutes left. Let's take um, Sadia Bati, and thank you, Sadia, for your question. Let's take a question from the public because we have so many, but we will not have time to cover them all. I think, well, luckily, most of them have been covered by 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 the discussion we just had. So Sadia is asking: Is there not a risk of awards rendered by a multilateral investment court, assuming the New York Convention applies, being set aside in France for violation of public policy? on the basis of inequality of the parties in the appointment process of the tribunal. Who would like to take this question? I mean, I can, I can yes, try. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> My lawyer, I would be, uh, I, I'll try to be legitimate to the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, we, we do have uh, in France uh, a, a famous uh, line of, uh, of, of uh, case law, which uh, Proudly led to adjustments of arbitration rules in the appointment of tribunals. Uh, I think uh, it goes back uh, also uh, to the issue, the distinction of equality of parties, equality of appointments, and what it really means uh, to be on an equal setting uh, when it comes to appointments. And something uh, that is clear uh, or that can be derived from that case law is that parties should be on equal footing. Uh, when it comes to how the appointment process is carried out, uh, meaning uh, uh, we have uh, the case of uh, multi-party arbitrations, uh, whereby uh, if one side that has several parties cannot appoint, you ca that can lead to the appointment of the full tribunal uh, um, in the same way and by an appointing authority. Um, this, this is the main concern. So if you look into uh, cases where or systems where both parties are submitted to um, a tribunal that was appointed as part of a yeah. court or something like that. Uh, that up and say thank you. That yeah. that would sorry. That that would lead to the same. Uh, that that there would be an argument at least to say, to oh. say that it's the same. Uh, setting for a party's uh, appointment. There will, of, of course, be an argument to say that it's not the same setting because the state has been the one appointing uh, at the time in a neutral uh, position, uh, being uh, appointing uh, on a kind of provisional way uh, without a specific dispute in mind. Uh, but the state did appoint uh, someone or some people while the investor is uh, locked with the appointment of its own state of nationality. So that would definitely be an interesting, uh, an interesting topic. Uh, uh, Alina, if I, if I can just add something very quickly. Of course. Um, <laughs> is that, is that um, uh, the, the, the system or the reforms, how they are envisaged right now, seem not to take into account um, um, many elements of other institutional rules than the exit ones. Um, and this is a very good um, uh, point in the sense that ICC awards, for instance, we have VAT cases, ICC awards are, of course, subject to uh, the recognition and enforcement under the New York Convention. Um, and I do have the impression that the reforms, I mean, the discussions around the reforms only take into account ICSID, the ICSID system, and how, and, and how self-contained that system is. Uh, the other um, procedural rules and the other um, institutions are a little bit left behind. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriele, for that uh, comprehensive answer. 
and and uh, that brings us to a conclusion. We've gone over time, um, uh, but I think it was well worth it. And I would like to thank all the attendees, most of all, especially those who stayed on to uh, on to the end. Um, unfortunately, we weren't uh, able to address all of your questions, but uh, I hope I, I, I speak on behalf of everyone, and I hope I, uh, that they're okay with this. But of course, if you if you, any of your questions weren't answered, please feel free to email them uh, to myself, and then uh, we can get back to you with answers on any of the questions that were not answered. Uh, and of course, thank you so much to our participants today. Uh, Harsha, Laura, uh, Gabriele, and of course, Toby. Uh, the discussion was stimulating, uh, fruitful. We're very grateful uh, for you to have taken the time to participate. And uh, thank you, of course, very much to ICC YAF for making this event possible. And uh, I look forward to, to uh, viewing the upcoming events of ICC YAF and, and continuing this discussion in other forums. So uh, once again, thanks very much on behalf of all of us and, uh, and hope to see you again very soon and uh, next time, hopefully in person, uh, but who knows when that might be. Uh, so again, thanks once again and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.